All right, so let's talk about soil and other aspects of plant nutrition. I need my pointer. Okay, so soil is made up of organic and inorganic components. The inorganic components would be rocks that have been crushed and are in various sizes. The organic components include both dead organic components like rotting plants and animals, and also many living organisms like worms, insects, bacteria, etc. So we'll talk about these things. So the texture of soil, what makes good soil is the particle size. And good soil has uh, an equal quantity of different particle sizes. And we classify the ground rock that's found in soil, the inorganic components of soil, as sand, silt, and clay. Uh, probably most of you can have a mental idea of how large a grain of sand is. Silt is uh, particles are much smaller than that. You could fit about a hundred silt, silt particles into a grain of sand, and clay is even smaller than that. So silt and clay particles would both be microscopic. Uh, soil has layers which we call soil horizons. Uh, the only one we're going to really worry about is topsoil. So topsoil is the fertile part of the soil, and it varies in depth a great deal depending on where in the world you are. Here in Illinois, we have some of the deepest topsoil in the world. It can be 6 to 10 feet deep here, which is really good for farming, which is why we have so much farmland here. Um, the, so the things in topsoil, besides our inorganic sand, silt, and clay mixture, we also have dead uh, organic material like uh, rotting plants and animals, and uh, that is called humus. Don't say hummus because that's the food. That's the bean dip. Uh, humus is the organic material, the rotting organic material that's found in soil. So topsoil can be only several inches thick, which wouldn't be very, that's what you typically find in like a rainforest. The topsoil is not very thick. Uh, in grasslands, you, where you have a lot of perennial plants, you tend to find much thicker topsoil. Uh, the other soil horizons would have progressively less organic matter in them. So the A horizon, which is the topsoil, this is about 50% organic material. Uh, and the B and the C horizons have more and more rock and less of this organic matter. And they're not really mixing that much with the topsoil. Um, so the texture of the soil is going to determine drainage. And you want good drainage, but not too much drainage <laughs> for good soil. So the larger the particles, like if there's a lot more sand in the soil, that's going to drain the water quicker. If you have a lot of small particles, like clay particles, that's going to make the soil stay very wet, uh, which could be bad for plants, depending on what you're, what you're growing. So ideally, uh, loam is what we call the best soil. So loam has about equal proportions of sand, silt, and clay for you know, the right amount of drainage. And it's also about 50% humus and organic matter and living things. So that would be an optimal soil. So if you buy a bag of soil uh, to put plants in, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get an equal mixture of these three inorganics and then about 50% um, dead organic material. There's not going to be anything alive in a bag of soil. Uh, so plants do need to get some nutrients from soil. You probably remember from photosynthesis in the previous semester that plants get carbon dioxide and thus all their carbon from the atmosphere. And they turn that carbon into sugars and proteins and fatty acids. But there are some uh, elements that they need from the soil. And uh, some of them are positively charged ions, which we've heard of before, potassium, calcium, 
magnesium. Magnesium is really important for plants. It's part of the structure of a chlorophyll molecule, so they need that for photosynthesis. And these positively charged ions are difficult to absorb into the root uh, because they tend to stick to negatively charged components in the soil. So the way that roots absorb these positively charged ions that they need is by something called cation exchange. So a cation, that just means a positively charged ion. Root hairs have living cells, and because they are in the dark, they're not photosynthesizing. So that means that respiration is going to be the dominant uh, uh, production of CO2 in the cells there. They're not absorbing CO2. They are going to be um, uh, respiration dominant, and so they're going to be producing CO2 as a byproduct. CO2, if you remember, is slightly acidic when you dissolve it in water. Uh, CO2 forms carbonic acid when you dissolve it in water, and that's going to release hydrogen ions. So root hairs in the soil release these hydrogen ions into the soil around the root because they're releasing carbon dioxide because they're respiring. And that those positively charged ions are going to allow the other positively, uh, positively charged ions to be released from the soil particles and so they can be absorbed by the root hairs along with water. So the humus, that's our organic material that's in soil. Uh, it's going to absorb water, so if you, have, if you don't have enough humus in the soil, the soil is going to drain of water too quickly. Um, and it's also going to help these uh, positively charged ions to be released from the soil. So our topsoil also includes many living organisms, some of which are directly beneficial to the plants, which we'll talk about those, but it includes bacteria, even some archaea, uh, fungi, algae, which are protists, a few other protists that are not photosynthetic, um, insects, worms, nematodes, um, and some of these are living on the decomposing organic material that's in the soil. Some of them are directly benefiting from the sugars that are made by the plants. So when we're uh, growing crops, we need to be concerned about adding nutrients to the soil. Because unlike in a natural ecosystem, agriculture, as humans practice it, is not a natural ecosystem. In fact, usually we are stripping away the natural ecosystem and then planting plants that we want to grow. And if you grow the same plants year after year after year, like wheat or barley or corn or soybeans, the soil eventually becomes depleted of the nutrients that that species specifically needs. So that's where... Uh, management practices come in and farmers have known for thousands of years humans have been growing crops for about 10,000 years and we've probably uh, known for almost that long that rotating crops is helpful for yield so if you either allow the soil to be fallow for several years and not grow any crops in it and then come back to it a few years later or you change which crops you're growing in a particular area year after year that helps the fertility of the soil um, and fertilization is directly adding nutrients to the soil and humans also discovered this thousands of years ago that adding things like manure or uh, even ground up animal parts to directly to the soil like fish bones and uh, animal blood actually helped the fertility of the soil. Uh, some, uh, well the most common example of disastrous soil management is the Dust Bowl of the 1930s in the United States, which was centered in Oklahoma, but also included Nebraska and Kansas. And this was, was a result of homesteaders moving west and farming land that was uh, very marginal in terms of rainfall for the crops that they were trying to grow. So they were clearing tall grass or a short grass prairie so short grass prairie is, uh, does not get a lot of rain. It gets less rain than what we get here in Illinois. Illinois is tall grass prairie and forest that needs more rainfall. If you go, as you go further west, 
in the U.S., the amount of rainfall decreases. By the time you're in Oklahoma, West Texas, Nebraska, South Dakota, the amount of rainfall is very, very marginal for most crops, grain crops like corn or wheat. And so the consequence of that was that crop failure occurred because some years there was just barely enough rain, other years there was not enough rain, and in the 1930s there was multiple years where there was not enough rain, and so the crops were dead, and so there was just bare topsoil, and uh, the Dust Bowl was what happened. When you don't have the prairie plants holding the soil, um, the topsoil pretty much just blew away. So uh, there are many practices to prevent things like this from happening again, and one of them is don't try to grow water-hungry crops in an area that's a borderline desert. Um, irrigation is one of the ways that this has been overcome. Um, if you're trying to grow crops any place uh, west of Iowa in the United States, you're going to need to irrigate. There isn't enough rainfall for most crops. Now, it's different if you're talking about rangeland for animals. So uh, natural rangeland uh, without any irrigation can be fine for sheep or cows um, if they're moved around properly and they're not allowed to overgraze certain areas. Um, but if you want to grow crops, you got to irrigate. Irrigation water comes from two sources. One would be surface water like rivers, diverting river water. Um, the Colorado River in the western United States is almost completely diverted to agricultural use. Um, or it's coming from underground. Uh, there are aquifers underground which are like, think of them like huge underwater underground lakes. And water can be drawn out for irrigation from these aquifers. The problem is if more water is being drawn out year after year than is being replaced by rainwater, then these aquifers become depleted and that can lead to sinkholes. Um, and we see sinkholes in several places in the U.S. Uh, where aquifers have been drained and one of these places would be in the western uh, United States and also in Florida where they use aquifer water for drinking water. Um, and that's, that's bad, although irrigation can allow us to grow crops in California, Nevada, Arizona, that we simply could not grow there without irrigation. And irrigation is used with great success all over the world. Uh, one of the negative consequences of irrigation, however, is something called salinization. So sal, sal, you can see the root in there for salt, sal. So salinization means that um, sodium chloride and other minerals build up because groundwater tends to have a lot of minerals in it. So if you're drawing up water from uh, aquifers underground, they tend to have more minerals. They have more calcium, they have more salt in them. And then when you flood the fields year after year with this uh, mineral heavy water, the water evaporates and the minerals stay. And so eventually the level of salt builds up in the soil to the point where crops will not grow in the salty soil. Um, if soil has too much salt in it, that prevents water from being absorbed by the roots of the plants. And the only solution for it is to stop growing crops in those fields for a number of years and allow the rainwater to wash away the excess salt and other minerals. Um, another solution would be to not use aquifers for um, irrigating those fields. Um, but it, this happens everywhere in the world that uses irrigation as well. If, the, if you're using aquifers for irrigation, eventually mineral buildup is going to be a problem because it, these ir irrigation is being used in areas that have low rainfall. That's why the crops are being irrigated. In places in the world where there's plenty of rainfall, irrigation is not used. Like here in Illinois, Iowa, Indiana, where there's plenty of rain, nobody irrigates. No, no farmers have the ability to irrigate their crops. They don't have the equipment. It's not set up because in, uh, you know, 90% of the time, there's plenty of rain. So this is a problem in already dry areas that are using irrigation. 
Um, so fertilization could also be difficult if you're buying commercial fertiliz fertilizers for your farm or for your garden. The three nutrients that are most important are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and they're important in that order. So nitrogen is the most important. Um, if you're trying to not use inorganic produced fertilizers, if you want to use um, uh, natural fertilizers, the best fertilizers come from animals. So they're either animal manure or they're ground up animals, bone meal, fish meal, blood meal. Um, those are the best fertilizers for crops. Um, and as they slowly break down, soil bacteria will slowly break down these products and that will release the nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium that the plants need. And most farmers today are using some sort of applied fertilizer. And most are not using natural organic fertilizers. Most are using um, synthetic fertilizers. Um, the pH of the soil is also important. Uh, we talked about cation exchange a minute ago. And that is, uh, should tell you that if the soil pH is is off, it's going to be difficult for plants to absorb minerals. And so if the pH, and that's also true if the pH is too high as well as too low. So if the soil is too basic, then plants are going to have trouble absorbing iron, which they need in very small amounts. If the soil is too acidic, um, then uh, uh, all of those positively charged ions are going to have difficulty being absorbed. And this is one of the reasons that acid rain is a problem. Um, so, and the reason is because if you have too many positively charged hydrogens floating around, if the soil is too acidic, all those positively charged minerals are going to wash away when it rains. And they won't be in the soil to be absorbed by the plant roots by cation exchange. Um, erosion in farming is also another huge problem because uh, the topsoil will eventually wash away. The topsoil gets built up by millions of years of the activity of plants in their natural ecosystem. And when we farm, we strip away the natural ecosystem that was building up that topsoil for millions of years. And it generally part of any kind of uh, plant farming, whatever you're growing, there's going to be exposed bare soil for some part of the season. Um, before the seeds are planted, after the crop is harvested, and that's when there's the greatest danger of erosion. And erosion can be from water, and erosion can be from wind as well. So there are all kinds of practices to help lessen erosion, like putting up wind breaks, uh, between farm fields, uh, like rows of trees to help lower the speed of the wind at ground level. Um, also, like in this image here, um, in, a, in hilly areas, uh, tilling across the grade of the hill so that water won't, won't flow quickly downhill, um, and that will help minimize the runoff. Um, No-till agriculture means that in, they don't turn over the soil every year. Instead, they just have a machine that directly plants the seeds in little rows, and they generally kill the weeds with Roundup or something um, in between those plantings. Uh, so that has advantages and disadvantages to it. Uh, but one of the advantages is helping to control erosion because you never have bare soil. Um, so plant roots absorb water um, and also those minerals that we were talking about. But really, most of what a plant needs, it's getting from the air and from the water. So if we, uh, most of a plant body is water, just like our bodies are over 70% water. Plants are, plants are 80 to 90% water. But if we dry all that out, what's left uh, is about 96% from carbon dioxide. So the, all of the carbohydrates, including the cellulose for the cell walls in plants, uh, most of the structure of their proteins, fatty acids, all of that is all from carbon dioxide, which they get from the air. The rest, 
4% of a plant's dry mass are the things that they can't get from carbon dioxide and from the air. These are things that they need in the soil. These are the limited nutrients, the essential nutrients that they need in the soil. And you'll notice some of the ones that plants need, we also need. So here is our major nutrients listed in the from highest quantity needed to lowest quantity. And you'll notice that most of the plant's mass here, 90%, so we'll add up the two 45% here, 90% of the, of the mass of the plant is coming from carbon dioxide and, and more from water. So if we add these up, that adds to up to 96% is just from water and carbon dioxide. The rest here are essential, but in much smaller amounts. So you'll notice nitrogen is the very next one here. 1.5% 1 of the plant's uh, dry mass is going to be nitrogen. And that's because nitrogen is in every protein. And nitrogen is part of the structure of chlorophyll and also of all the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. Um, potassium, calcium, uh, also very important. They're enzyme cofactors. They're uh, found in cell walls. Magnesium is really important because it's a major component in chlorophyll. And that's one of the reasons magnesium is an, is an essential nutrient for us, too. And that's one of the reasons why green leafy things are a good source of magnesium. Because any place you have chlorophyll, you're going to have some magnesium there. Uh, phosphorus is really important. That's for DNA, RNA, phospholipids, which, remember, is the membrane uh, a structural molecule, and ATP, which is a nucleic acid. Um, sulfur is part of proteins. So these are the macronutrients in plants. So macronutrients are the things that they need in large amounts. Um, the micronutrients are things that are essential but that they need in very small amounts. And these are micronutrients for us too. Uh, iron, manganese, uh, zinc, copper, nickel, molybdenum. Uh, these are also things that humans need in small amounts. Um, and you'll notice the ones that are that we need that aren't on this list are things that we have trouble getting from plants like iodine. Uh, so plants don't need iodine, but we do. And uh, that's why we have to be concerned about that, even if you're eating a pretty varied diet, because that's something that you, you can't get from eating plants. Um, and these micronutrients, they're needed in small amounts because they're generally enzyme cofactors. Sometimes they bind to DNA binding proteins. So they're essential, but they're needed in very small amounts. Um, plants have relationships with other organisms. These relationships are often mutualistic. So we'll talk about this when we get to ecology a little bit more. But there are three kinds of relationships or symbiotic relationships that organisms can have. Different species of organisms we're talking about here. Sometimes even different kingdoms of organisms. So if a relationship is mutualistic, that means that both individuals benefit. Uh, if it's Parasitic, we'll talk about some parasitic plants at the end. A parasitic relationship is one-sided. Only one individual benefits. The victim of the parasite is harmed. So in a parasitic re relationship, one benefits, the other one is harmed. And then there's also commensal relationships, which we'll talk about that at the end of this section as well. In a commensal relationship, one organism benefits and the other one is neutral. There's no harm, but there's no benefit either. And sometimes biologists aren't sure whether a relationship is mutualistic or a commensal relationship. Sometimes it's hard to tell if both parties are benefiting. So we'll talk about uh, some of plants' relationships, especially with bacteria and fungi, which are mutualistic relationships. There are many other of these type of symbiotic relationships. Uh, lichens, which you might remember from um, the first semester from Bio 1151, usually they're included with fungi in the fungal kingdom because most of their mass is a fungus, but they have a symbiotic photosynthetic organism that's either an algae, a protist algae, or cyanobacteria. And these photosynthetic cells are in between the fungal cells. Uh, and they both benefit. This is a mutualistic relationship. Um, the 
photosynthetic organism is supplied with water and minerals and gets a safe place to live in a generally a very harsh environment. And the fungus benefits because it gets sugar from the photosynthetic organism. Um, here's another interesting symbiotic relationship that we'll talk more about when we get to the ecology section. Uh, this is a bullhorn acacia, which is a plant that's native to Mexico. It's a tree. And it has formed a very specific relationship with one species of ant. It provides the ant with a place to live. So you can, these large hollow thorns on the bullhorn acacia uh, are hollow, and the ants actually live inside the thorns. The plant feeds the ants with little packets of protein and fats. There are little special modified leaves on the bullhorn acacia that these ants harvest and consume that provides them with all the nutrition that they need. And that's a lot of work for this acacia plant. It's spending an enormous amount of energy feeding and housing these ants. So what is the ant doing for the acacia tree? Well, the ants are absolutely vicious protectors of these trees. So one ant colony lives on a single tree. They live in the tree. They live in those horns and they patrol the tree all day. They will kill anything that tries to eat that tree. They will even attack large herbivores um, like cattle or deer and bite them and get them to leave the tree alone. They will attack plants that vines that try to grow on the tree, seedlings that come up under the tree, they will chop them down and kill them. So they are very protective of their tree and it's been shown experimentally, if you experimentally kill the ants, the tree will very quickly be eaten by other things in the forest. So uh, it's a, this is a, a really kind of extreme example of a symbiotic relationship between an animal and a plant. So in the next video, we will talk about very specific relationships between fungi and plants and bacteria and plants and what they both benefit, their mutualistic relationships, um, that plants simply couldn't exist without these mutualistic relationships with the bacteria and with the fungi. So we'll talk about that in the second half of this chapter.